before we before we actually begin, let's open with a word of prayer. And so if you if you're able, bow with me please. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, as we seek to follow in the footsteps of our master and his church of old, to partake of the bread and the wine and the ordinance of humility, we pray, dear God, that the truths of these things would be uh, real to us today, that we would not be caught up in the form and fashion of it but that we would really receive the beauty of the ordinance which was left behind for us to do. You told us, dear Lord, that happy we would be if we did them. And so I pray, Lord, that the praise of God would be upon both hearts and lips as we partake of this sacrament. Bless us now with your spirit. And Father, attend this reading to put our hearts and minds in the proper place. In Jesus' name, amen. I would, like to, I would like to read something in, in your hearing. And as I, often, as I often try to do, I encourage people to do, is to uh, listen and with the sanctified imagination try to place yourself at the scene. And so I'm reading from Desire of Ages. And this is the chapter, In Remembrance of Me. And I'll start on page 655, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. And so I invite you to uh, listen attentively to the things that we will read together. Though Jesus knew Judas from the beginning, he washed his feet. And the betrayer was privileged to unite with Christ in partaking of the sacrament. A long-suffering Savior held out every inducement for the sinner to receive him, to repent, and to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. This example is for us. When we suppose one to be in error and sin, we are not to divorce ourselves from him. By no careless separation are we to leave him a prey to temptation or drive him upon Satan's battleground. This is not Christ's method. It was because the disciples were erring and faulty that he washed their feet. And all but one of the twelve were thus brought to repentance. Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. This the Holy Spirit plainly teaches in 1 Corinthians 5.11. But beyond this, none are to pass judgment. God has not left it with men to say who shall present themselves on these occasions. For who can read the heart? Who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. When believers assemble to celebrate the ordinances, there are present messengers unseen by human eyes. There may be a Judas in the company, and if so, messengers from the prince of darkness are there, for they attend all who refuse to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly angels are also present. These unseen visitants are present on every such occasion. There may come into the company persons who are not in heart servants of truth and holiness, but who may wish to take part in the service. They should not be forbidden. They are witnesses, excuse me, there are witnesses present who were present when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and of Judas. More than human eyes behold the scene. Christ by the Holy Spirit is there to set the seal to his own ordinance. 
He is there to convict and soften the heart. Not a look, not a thought of contrition escapes his notice. For the repentant, broken-hearted one, he is waiting. All things are ready for that soul's reception. He who washed the feet of Judas longs to wash every heart from the stain of sin. None should exclude themselves from the communion because some who are unworthy may be present. Every disciple is called upon to participate publicly and thus bear witness that he accepts Christ as his personal savior. It is at these his own appointments that Christ meets his people and energizes them by his presence. Hearts and hands that are unworthy may even administer the ordinance, yet Christ is there to minister to his children. All who come with their faith fixed upon him will be greatly blessed. All who neglect these seasons of divine privilege will suffer loss. Of them it may be appropriately be said, ye are not all clean. In partaking with his disciples of the bread and the wine, Christ pledged himself to them as their redeemer. He committed to them the new covenant by which all who receive him become children of God and joint heirs with Christ. By this covenant, every blessing that heaven can bestow for this life and the life to come was theirs. This covenant deed was to be ratified with the blood of Christ, and the administration of the sacrament was to be kept before the disciples, the infinite sacrifice made for each of them individually as a part of the great whole, the great whole of human, uh, fallen humanity. But the communion service was not to be a season of sorrowing. This was not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather about the table, they are not to remember and lament, lament their shortcomings. They are not to dwell upon their past religious experience, whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They are not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. The preparatory service has embraced all this. The self-examination, the confession of sin, the reconciliation of differences has all been done. Now they come to meet with Christ. They are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. They are to open the soul to the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness with hearts cleansed by Christ's most precious blood in full consciousness of his presence, although unseen, they are to hear his words, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Our Lord says under conviction of sin, Remember that I died for you. When oppressed and persecuted and afflicted for my name's sake and the gospels, remember my love, so great that for you I gave my life. When your duties appear stern and severe and your burdens too heavy to bear, remember that for your sake I endured the cross, despising the shame. When your hearts sink from the trying ordeal, remember that your Redeemer liveth to make intercession for you. The communion service points to Christ's second coming. It was designed to keep this hope vivid in the minds of, his, of the disciples. Whenever they meet together to commemorate his death, they recount how he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In their tribulation, they found comfort in the hope of their Lord's return. Unspeakably precious to them was the thought, as oft as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. These are the things we are never to forget. The love of Jesus with its constraining power is to be kept fresh in our memory. Christ has instituted this service that it may speak to our senses of the love of God that has been expressed in our behalf. There can be no union between our soul and God except through Christ. The union and love between brother and brother must be cemented and rendered eternal by the love of Jesus. And nothing less than the death of Christ could make his love effic 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 efficacious for us. It is only because of his death that we can look with joy to his second coming. His sacrifice is the center of our hope. Upon this, we must fix our faith. The ordinances that point to our Lord's humiliation and suffering are regarded too much as a form. They were instituted for a purpose. Our senses need to be quickened to lay hold of the mystery of godliness 
It is the privilege of all to comprehend far more than we do the expiatory sufferings of Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have, ever, have eternal life. To the cross of Calvary, bearing a dying Savior, we must look. Our eternal interests demand that we show faith in Christ. Our Lord has said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is true of our physical nature. To the death of Christ we owe even this earthly life. The bread we eat is the purchase of his broken body. The water we drink is bought by his spilled blood. Never one saint or sinner eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. The glory of Calvary is stamped on every loaf. It is reflected in every water spring. All this Christ taught in appointing the emblems of his great sacrifice. The light shining from that communion service in the upper chamber makes sacred the provisions of our daily life. The family board becomes the table of the Lord in every meal, a sacrament. And how much more are Christ's words true of our spiritual nature. He declares, whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. It is by receiving the life as poured out on Calvary's cross that we can live the life of holiness. And this life we receive by receiving his word, by doing the, those things which he has commanded. Thus we become one with him. He that eateth my flesh, he says, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. To the Holy Communion, this scripture in a special sense applies. As faith contemplates our Lord's great sacrifice, the soul assimilates the spiritual life of Christ. That soul will receive spiritual strength from every communion. The service forms a living connection by which the believer is bound up with Christ and thus bound up with the Father. In a special sense, it forms a connection between dependent human beings and God. As we receive the bread and the wine symbolizing Christ's broken body and spilled blood, we in imagination join in the scene of communion in the upper chamber. We seem to be passing through the garden consecrated by the agony of him who bore the sins of the world. We witness the struggle by which our reconciliation with God was obtained. Christ is set forth crucified among us. Looking upon the crucified redeemer, we more fully comprehend the magnitude and meaning of the sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven. The plan of salvation is glorified before us and the thought of Calvary awakens living and sacred emotions in our hearts. Praise to God and the Lamb will be in our hearts and on our lips. For pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. He who beholds the Savior's matchless love will be elevated in thought, purified in heart, transformed in character. He will go forth to be a light to the world to reflect in some degree this mysterious love. The more we contemplate the cross of Christ, the more fully we shall adopt the language of the apostle when he said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. As we break to participate in the ordinance of humility, contemplate the thoughts that Jesus even still washed Judas' feet. He did not point the finger even though he knew Judas was the one that would betray him. He still held out inducements to cause Judas to yield his heart and yield his life. This was Judas's last try. This was his last straw. Christ was trying to break the heart of Judas and he still tries to do that for us today at every communion service to break our heart so that we can be cleansed and washed by the blood of the Lamb so that we can partake of the flesh and body uh, the, the, the body and the blood of Christ worthily. And so as we uh, separate from our, for our, our foot washing, keep these things in your mind. Keep these things in your thoughts. And remember that selfishness and pride
cannot live in the, the heart of one who keeps fresh the scenes of Calvary. Shall we pray? Our loving Savior, as we have read these words, we pray that it would have made the proper impression. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would look past the form of the communion service and look to what it symbolized. The fact that our life can be cleansed by the washing of our Lord. The fact that we can eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God and have eternal life in us. The fact that when we do these things, as often as we do them, we do show forth the Lord's death until he come. This communion service, Lord, points us back to what you have done for us on Calvary and points us forward to the time where we know that sin would have been blotted out. And Father, we look forward to this experience. And so in miniature, we participate today with the hope of the cross and the hope of eternal life before us. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your kindness. And bless each and every participant is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.